I want to just dive in here a little bit with a couple things. Uh, got a couple things stacked up, and then see where we land. But I want to hit this responding biblically to criticism. Um, this is a real practical thing uh, for Equip. Uh, if you've not been criticized, hang on. It'll be here tonight or tomorrow or sometime. And especially if you're ministering for Jesus, and especially if you're doing it in a public way or whatever, you, you just it's going to come. And so uh, the, the issue isn't whether it's going to come. It's coming. It's how you're going to respond. And this is such a big deal for believers because what I'm going to share with you is an issue of keeping your heart free, glorifying the Lord, blessing others, and stopping a chain reaction that the enemy is constantly starting through words of criticism that then get multiplied with us through, with, through us with our hurt and our anger and our slander and those kind of things that come. So I know this is just really practical, but honestly, this whole deal, if it's outfitted right and you're responding right to this, it begins to stop the multiple strategies of the enemy to infect um, the earth. And so the Lord uh, talks about these things a lot, but I, I wanted to bounce off just for a few minutes on this arena. King David. King David knew criticism, rejection, and slander, and persecution almost his whole life. Um, whether it was a demonized Saul from when he was a very, very young man to disgruntled leaders in his own kingdom to a divisive Absalom, his son, who's trying to steal the kingdom from him, David knew relational trouble from young age to old. This was just part and parcel. If you read the Psalms, he's processing a lot of this in a lot of different places. And if you read the history of David, David, there's nothing... No one has more press in the Bible than, um, than David except Jesus. Jesus has the most, and then David is the second most talked about person, and his life was fraught with these kinds of troubles. Psalms 109 is one of the many places that talk about how David was under relational pressure and how he set his heart to respond. So I want to show you this psalm. It starts, and it's just, you need to read the whole thing, but the first four verses here are, Be not silent, O God of my praise. For wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. So he's having literal, I mean, it's, it's one sentence, but it's probably hours, days, months of lying, deceitful kinds of stuff that's going on. Saul not only was trying to murder him and kill him, he was stirring up gossip and slander and all kinds of strategies against him. Verse 3, they encircle me with words of hate and they attack me without cause. Verse 4 is what I want you to see. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. This verse has been a powerful verse for me as I have followed the lead of the man after God's own heart. This is how a person after God's own heart responds to the criticism, to the rejection, to the lies, to the slander that happens. His response here, in return for my love, and he's saying clearly this is injustice, they have come against me and accused me and stirred up all this stuff so the balances are not equal but I give myself to prayer it's going to take I think the power of the Holy Spirit for you to do that because here's the deal the Lord the enemy wants to do a stimulus response to poke you in a certain area so you'll respond in the flesh and he can get a flesh domino fall going around your circle of influence and so David says this is what I'm doing what I'm doing when I get this accusation is I'm giving myself in an inordinate way to prayer. I'm giving myself in prayer for them, for myself, for the situation. You'll see in the Psalms how he prays. And some of them are aggressive, like break the teeth of my enemies, okay, and break in. But he's looking for the hand of the Lord to bring justice. As you knew, remember, he'll say about Saul, twice he could have killed him. It's like the Lord delivered him right there vulnerable and he won't do it. Because he respects the anointing. He'll say, I won't touch the Lord's anointed. This is a demonized king. Spirits are on him. David actually led multiple deliverance services for Saul by playing his harp. And demons would come off of him. But then they'd come back on him in the session, in the deliverance session. And Saul would throw a spear at him trying to kill him. You remember that? You need to read that. It's crazy stuff. But Paul would give himself, I mean, uh, David would give himself to prayer. He would give himself to blessing. It's just like, this is shocking. And what it is, is a supernatural work of a man after God's own heart. The Apostle Paul also had an unusual amount of relational trials that led to slander and many physical sufferings. Actually, the guy who baptized him, Ananias, is told, this is going to be the deal. He's going to carry my word before the Gentile kings, before Jews. He's going to, this guy is one of my main carriers of the word. And I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name. That's his 
vision statement from the Lord by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to Ananias. And so he experienced that suffering from the beginning. From the beginning, he's seen as a fraud, a fake. He's had some kind of false conversion. Some kind of, he probably made up the story on the road to Damascus. You know, all this stuff is just crazy stuff. And his whole ministry, he's chased, beaten, lied about. He has ministry teams that join him. Demas is with him for a while. One of his primary disciples, Demas. And then Demas later will turn against him because he falls in love with the world. His heart's breaking over churches that have fallen into unholiness. And he's having Jews hunt him down on a regular basis. Stunning, actually, what's going on to him and how he wrote about these troubles. So one of those places is Romans chapter 12. Bless those who persecute you, Paul writes. By the way, I just want you to picture this. He's not sitting down going, what would be the noble thing, the big noble thing? (laughs) He's sitting down and probably grunting a little bit if he's writing this. Maybe somebody's writing it for him because sometimes his eyes were so bad he couldn't write. But he's got back at him. He's been beat with rods and stones and whips and he knows the people who did it. And he writes this, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If it's possible, as far as it is, it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, this is the big, it's verse 19. I don't think I have it here. Yeah, verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourself. And by the way, in the Greek, the word never here, it means never. Never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy, which by the way, when he says enemy here, it's not some unknown guy usually that's writing an article or got a blog, you know, over in Damascus that's writing. This is not what's happening. These are, these are probably people that he knew, sometimes were close to him. The greatest enemies are usually people that are close to us or we've been in association with. He says, when your enemy's hungry, take him to lunch. Feed him. If he's thirsty, I want you to give him something to drink. This is what I've done. And I think what he's writing about, he's done it. I think he's actually handed food to his enemies. And he felt the supernatural power of God begin to manifest as he stopped a satanic cycle. That's what Paul's talking about right here, is stopping the satanic cycle of division and murder and anger that happens on the body. This is spiritual warfare right here. And so he says, give him food. If he's hungry, thirst, water. So for by so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. And I think this context is, out of Proverbs, but it's to heap it on that, that whatever thing that's inside him that's producing this funk in this deal. So don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So David's doing this in the Old Testament. Paul's doing it here. Paul's clear. Paul will talk about false apostles. He, I mean, he, there's some, some guys that get some bad press. You know, from, Paul says, Demas deserted me. Billions of people have read that. That sounds like gossip, doesn't it? He's, he's right about those super apostles, and he's sarcastic about them. He's dealing with his own frustrations, and there's different dimensions and dynamics of how this all goes down. But I'm telling you this. When I go, I'm kaleidoscoping out of David's issues in the Old Testament, down through Paul, a chief apostle, into Jesus, you'll see that there is no way around the issue that Jesus wants us, the king of kings wants us to love those who do not love us. He wants us to pray for those who persecute us. Paul was filled with the spirit of Jesus, and he's manifesting what Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't have the passages here, but you'll remember what he said. If you love those who love you, how much better are you than the Gentiles? How much better are you than the, even enemies, bad people love those who love them. What's gonna be the miracle of my covenant family on planet Earth is they're gonna love those that don't love them. They're gonna extend blessing to those. Now listen, and you can do this without affirming the bad behavior. You don't have to affirm the lie. We talked about this. We're always walking this line in our unity efforts with the body of Christ in Wichita in the area. I love the whole body of Christ. I don't love everything they do. And you can make that delineation. You really can. But right here, Paul is talking about something that's pretty powerful. David says, give yourself to prayer. Paul's saying, feed them, bless them to release a blessing. And Jesus is going to say, love them and pray for them in the Sermon on the Mount. So... 
some steps to experience when you experience criticism. Anybody in here has ever been criticized or slandered or treated unjustly, please say, oh my. And it's coming. It's coming. There's more of it coming, especially if you're going to get close to Jesus. Because people are just going to irritate you. Human beings are mean to each other sometimes. Even the people that are very close to you. So number one, I just want to encourage you to immediately pray, asking the Holy Spirit to help in responding as Jesus responded. And what I mean there, and I wish I would have written, ask for a change of your default. I wonder what your default is when somebody slanders you or is angry at you. Because usually people's default is to do the exact same thing back. What Paul and David are doing is saying, change your default. When you get the bad word, don't meditate the bad word and how unjust it is. Immediately turn into prayer. What if you did that? What if you immediately, God bless, that's unjust. It's wrong. It's even deceitful what they said. I know it clearly. So whatever's oppressing my brother, my sister, I labor for them in prayer. If we would spend way more time praying for our enemy's freedom instead of repeating their mistakes out there, I believe the kingdom of God would come with greater power. And uh, I know about this subject because I'm a great failure in it at times through my lives. I thought I could talk my way out of trouble, talk them out, or I could out, you know, talk to other people. And it just never works. Never works, and my soul gets funky. The only thing that works is when I turn to Yahweh, open my heart, and say, Lord, bless the brother. Bless the brother. I don't know how to do it. It's, the, it's why the Lord's Prayer is so irritating to me. At the part of forgive me of my sins as I... Uh, I just want to edit it so much. Forgive me of my sins as I forgive others who sin against me. And I, I don't know what all that means and what the dimensions are and how, long you get, how much you got to hang out with people that do this. But I'll tell you this. This is the age that you will have the opportunity to forgive enemies. Because there will be no enemies for eternity. For eternity, enemies are taken care of. Right now is the now where you get to love those who are unlovable. Because everybody in resurrected bodies in the Jesus kingdom are going to be real lovable. But right now, you got the opportunity to do what he did, which is radical. Number two, try to learn something from it. Here's the pain in the rear to me, is that when people criticize me, people close and whatever, it stinks, but if I'll spend time thinking about it, there's an ounce of truth in it. There's actually something of wisdom for me to learn with what they're saying. It could be 1%, not 10%. 30, but, but I think that it's unwise to not think a little bit about the criticism that you get to think through how, what, that, what might be happening with you. And I've had multiple examples like that. Number three, extend an invitation of love and restoration to the source. That you would literally physically lay out an opportunity to go to lunch, to have a coffee, to sit down. They may say no, but all it says is as is much possible with you. As, as, as po you don't have to do any more than that. You don't have to make it successful. You've got to, by faith, though, step out of your stuff and begin to extend and say, the opinion of my father is more important than me getting my way right here. And that's the hard stuff. Number four, resolve not to slander the person to others. That's a tough one. And, I, and I'll, I'll tell you this. There's slander. There it is. They stink, and this is what they did. And then there's creative slander. Could you pray for my brother? Because he's got this issue with really being a booger head. He's got an issue. You know how it is. You drop it like it's some noble thing you're doing. And um, I just think you need to be aware of that because uh, we've got to resolve to get this thing under control and not spread the poison that was spread to us. And we can put a stop to that, but it's going to take some training in our hearts. So I just want to encourage you tonight because if you don't have criticism, you're going to get it. It's coming. There's trouble. It's going to happen in your family. It's going to happen with your friendships. It's going to happen rejection, whatever form it comes in, just or unjust because of your brokenness or theirs, probably both. It's just coming. And again, I wish I was better at it. I wish I'd had better training at it. But I know this is a big part of us bearing the gospel. This is really, we don't just tell the gospel. We become the gospel. And becoming the gospel means that we begin to respond differently than the world to enemies. And it takes some powerful thing. And again, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to, you know, get you to do something that's emotionally dishonest. But I bet your emotions are hardly ever loyal to what the king really wants to do. And I think he's looking for miracles of restoration 
that uh, are more about his name than they are even about the relationships that we're having trouble in. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name for everybody in the room, by the power of the Spirit, would you raise up, especially as we go for John 17, radical unity. What's that look like? How do we, how do we forgive? How do we bless? How do we give ourselves? We love someone, they accuse us. Teach us how to give ourselves to prayer. To immediately, they go to the top of our prayer list. And we begin to labor for their freedom. Never excusing bad behavior, but laboring for a brother or sister who are caught in bondage. Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to love. How did you love enemies and let them kill you and actually pardon them? We just pray you show us how to do that. And whatever false form of justice and us doing it by our own effort to get it has uh, seeped into our lives, set us free. And uh, I pray you just show us how to navigate this. Holy Spirit, lead everyone in this reality. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.